playing with your food. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid stand mixer and attachments. Hello and welcome to the first of the 2020 British Library food season coming to you from the beautiful River Cottage Garden. Thank you to KitchenAid for so generously sponsoring this season of events. My name is Polly Russell, I'm a curator at the British Library and I'm the founder and curator of the food season. And this year I've had the huge pleasure to work with Angela Clutton as the guest director. Now, as usual with the food season, we wanted to make sure that it was eclectic and relevant. And in the context of COVID-19, which has so challenged and in some cases transformed our relationship with food, I can think of no two better people than Hugh Fernley Whittingstall and B. Wilson to speak to at this current moment. Hugh bounded onto our screens around 20 years ago with his tousled hair and boyish enthusiasm, a total passion for locally sourced food and a commitment to the environment. By my counting, and I may have got it wrong, he has written 16 books, no, 20 books, and made 16 television series. I'm not sure it's that many books, but you, if it's you've counted, it could be in that book. The summary is you're an overachiever. <laughs> so, <laughs> amazing output. He is a vocal critic of the contemporary food system. His programmes like Hughes Fish Fight and War and Waste have brought to the public's attention the connection between food production and consumption, the environment and public health. But although Hugh is a vocal critic of food production, he's also a passionate believer that individual consumer choice can make a massive difference in terms of diet and health and the environment. So what a perfect person to speak to now. B, another high achiever, is the author of six wonderful books, including First Bite and How We Eat. She is a scholar and a writer who sort of defies definition. Her writing weaves together sociology, anthropology, biology, uh, physics, politics, everything in order to understand our relationship with food. She's also a passionate and very effective food campaigner and is the co-founder of Taster Ed, a wonderful charity which was set up to transform children's relationship with food through taste. I'm sure we'll hear about that later. Now B and Hugh's books, which are wonderful if you've not read them, are available on your screens on a tab, uh, which I believe is uh, called Books. And uh, so please look there. We wish that you could be here with us, but this is 2020, so of course that is not possible. But we would love to hear your questions. So if you want to submit questions, there's a form at the bottom of your screens. Please do do so, and we will get to them as soon as we can. But for now, I'm going to start by asking you both how, I mean, this has been such a strange time for everyone, and I just wondered how for you personally, this period of COVID has transformed your own sort of food practices, your cooking, your shopping. Are you doing everything the same? Has anything changed? Anything challenged you? Hugh? Um, more of the same, I would say, more, more than ever before. I've been based here in Devon. I don't live here, lovely as it is. I live about 15 minutes down the road, but I do have a, a veg patch. It's not nearly as exciting looking as this one, uh, but it's pretty good and... We've just been eating grapes from your garden. You have been so eating some I think really it must, nice it must be pretty grapes endless. from my greenhouse, which I'm very proud of. They are sort of, those grapes are the, are the cherry on the cake of my garden, as it were. <laughs> they were well, good. I'm glad you like them. Uh, they're, they're very special. I, I think one thing I have done talking of, of I mean, I, I feel I've relished everything so much during this time. The food we've grown ourselves, uh, the family meals that we've had together, I've got, a, I've got a mixture of grown up and not so grown up children and they were all at home, even the, the two who've sort of left home were all at home during lockdown. And that was extraordinary and we yeah. cooked together, uh, we, we, we did a lot of stuff in the garden, uh, we pickled things, we, we, it, it was sort of, it was an extraordinary time. So there have been very, very many hard aspects to lockdown and I'm sure we'll talk about them and in the context of the hospitality industry it's very, very worrying. 
But personally and at home, from a family point of view, we were very blessed to be in this beautiful place and we, we made the most of it. And what about for you, B, in Cam based in Cambridge? Based in Cambridge. So I, mean, I think in my different. house, as yeah. in so many others, it was the rise of banana bread, the fall of the sandwich. <laughs> I was so yeah. happy to see Did the back you, of... Do you make sourdough? Are you that person? I sometimes do, but actually there's an amazing woman in Cambridge who has an Instagram account called Bread on a Bike. She doesn't actually bike it round, you go round on your bicycle to collect it. And she's such a good baker, my sourdough doesn't quite match up. Okay. So I did have, a, every so often I go through a renewed phase of trying to get my starter going. I did do that in lockdown. I'm more likely to make a quick bread. I make very good challa bread and soda bread and various things that don't take us. I'm impatient. Um, <laughs> but for me, I think as with Hugh, it was sort of more of the same. It was values that I felt I had anyway, but somehow wasn't able to put into practice mm -hmm. in the rush of modern life. So I felt I suddenly had, I talk about this in my book, but not just time, but synchronized time. That thing of everyone being around the table yeah. in the same place at the same time, not just for dinner, but for lunch too which was magical much of the time, even though I was then the person having to get the food ready. So there were moments when I felt like a 1950s housewife cooking all the time. And there were so many other times where I just thought, as with Hugh, this is great. We will never take food for granted again. And I sort of completely bought into that idea. Now that we see how precious food is, mm. now that we've gone through panic buying, now that we understand. Well, and then it's been really sad in so many ways. Well, A, to see that the kind of privilege that Hugh and I had absolutely has not been shared by everyone in Britain. It's also been a time of colossal widening. Well, well that actually brings me on to the sort of next question, which is you know, you, you've talked about your, your own experiences, but then thinking more broadly about what, what light has COVID shed for you on your understandings of our contemporary food system, you know, and where we're at now. What is that, you know, has it been a time of, you know, hope or hopelessness or where are you with that? Well, that, that's a good question. And, and of course, we, we have to acknowledge our extraordinary privilege in having access to this kind of food. Um, I think what, what COVID has done is it's, it's, sharpened the, it's sharpened the truth about everything, the stuff that we sort of already knew. Uh, but one thing it's definitely uh, emphasised is the extraordinary inequality in, 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 in food uh, as, and in many things. But, but I mean... It's for me. It's made the idea of levelling up and 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 helping everybody to eat better food more urgent, mm. much even more urgent. It's been mm. very urgent for a very long time. It's made it feel even more urgent, and I just think maybe it's possibly made it feel more achievable. There's just a little glimmer of hope in all that gloom, and some of that's come from things that the government is now finally saying, which it's never said before, uh, about intervening on, on, on behalf of our health. And I, I, I'm sorry if I've barged into one of your questions, but, no, no. but that, that's where we've got to. And I, I mean, that has been extraordinary and it's an extraordinary opportunity because a government that's practically been allergic to the idea of health intervention, that sort of denounced and, and, and decried the idea that they might ever tell us what to eat or, or help us even with our eating, um, because they don't believe in intervening in our health. And that it's an individual's responsibility. And that it's an individual's responsibility yeah. uh, has, has actually under, has overseen and, and, and enacted the single biggest health intervention of all time, as have governments all over the country. But, the, the, you know, governments have now said, we need to step in and help you all with this terrible pandemic. Well, guess what's a bigger pandemic or, or epidemic anyway uh, than COVID-19? Mm -hmm. Well, it's obesity and it's been going on for a whole lot longer. So let's take some of that readiness mm -hmm. to intervene uh, and pull levers and make decisions and change laws and tell businesses that they can do this and they can't do that. Let's take some of that willingness to act and let's apply it to this terrible problem of food inequality and obesity that's such a blight on, on this country and so many others. Do you think following on from that, B, and you jump in, but that there's a particular challenge with food in terms of intervention because it is so intimate, it's so personal, that people feel like, you know, no one should tell me what to eat. Nobody should, you know, you get accused beyond the nanny state. It's like, get out of my kitchen. 
Absolutely. And so it's more problematic than intervening in perhaps other sectors. There's a huge challenge and it's partly people don't really know what the intervention should be because there isn't just one intervention. There are many, many things that need to happen at the same time. And the ones that people and governments usually focus on are ones that do seem very negative, which is telling somebody not to put something in their mouth, which is a really intimate thing to say to somebody or to say you should put this in your mouth, which is a still more intimate thing to say. And if you think back to how we were as hunter gatherers in the past, deciding is this berry toxic, is this one good to eat? Taking matter from the outside world and putting it inside of yourself is one of the most profound and intimate things a human being can do. You do not want to be told what to do yeah, and, on that and, score and also by a government. also one of the things that's most going to affect your health and, and well-being. And hugely I mean, going to affect your health and well-being. So, so the stakes could not be higher, but the discourse around it is really, really difficult. I mean, I think, I agree with Hugh that there, there's been a sort of coming together of lots of shared realisations. And the question is where we then go with these shared realisation. So Marcus Rashford and the free school meals, suddenly as one, lots and lots of people in Britain suddenly thought it's absolutely indecent and wrong that children on low incomes should go through the summer being hungrier than they are when they're at school. And we haven't still solved that, but at least we're suddenly seeing, well, it's always been indecent and wrong, but something about COVID has brought that to people's attention. I do think Food has become a priority as never before. Maybe there's something about that sight of the empty supermarket mm. shelves that right. kind of chilled us and made us think, oh, this isn't just a never-ending tap that comes from God knows where. Food actually has a source. There are people who bring it to us. There are these people who've now redefined rightly as key workers mm. who are farmers and people who run shops. Where we go next, in answer to your question, yes, I think food is uniquely problematic because if you're looking at the foods that people probably should eat less of, it's not just like with smoking or with alcohol where you can just say, well, with smoking, you could just say, don't do it. And what can we do as a series of policy measures to make sure nobody does it? Anything you do with food to say, absolutely don't do it, can have the potential consequence of backfiring, generating eating disorders, giving people an even more complicated relationship with food. It's difficult. And go, yeah. Well, it, it, it is very difficult. Intervention is very, hard, very, very hard. And I, it's really, and you're absolutely right about that, that intensity and emotion that's connected with, with what you put in your mouth. But I mean, let, we have to face up to the fact that what we put in our mouths has been manipulated and handed down to us for so long and in such an aggressive way and so mm. many billions of, of mm. dollars and pounds and every other currency has been spent on persuading us to eat things that are really very bad yes. for us and are harming our health. And the amount of money going the other way or the amount of, the amount of spend going on advertising or promoting or marketing this stuff <laughs> is practically non-existent. It's in fact, I think it's about 1.2%. And, and that's in extremely problematic. Mm -hmm. So I think before we are too, before we get, I mean, we have to be sensitive about intervention, but I also think we have to be careful not to be too precious because it's pretty urgent. And there, there are many levers, you say, that, that, need to, that, that could be pulled, and we need to start pulling pretty all much of them. in all of yeah, We need exactly. to pull all of them at one. And we do. One, one, of, them is, one one of them is junk food. Oh. I mean, that's, I mean we've, got a, we've, got a, we've got a a shopping list, and yours mm. and mine might not be exactly the same, but it's a pretty good overlap. <laughs> but but you know, we, we've got to curb the excesses mm. of junk food advertising. Mm. I would say we have to put something back the other way mm -hmm. and put a lot of uh, effort and energy and creativity and the genius of marketing into pushing this stuff, because mm. this is good stuff mm. to push. The green mm. stuff, the healthy stuff, the whole grains, mm the fruits. Yeah, so if you look at the, sorry, Polly. No, go, go, go. No. Well, I was just going to say, if you look at, I sometimes think in this country we are too parochial and we sometimes think that Britain has these unique problems with food. And the part that we miss is actually, it's a global story. And again, the pandemic has brought this home that these same problems are existing in every country in the world. The same obesity, the same type two diabetes. And it's partly because we have the same six multinational food corporations yeah. shoving these products down. And about down the same these... six crops as yes, well. And about the same six crops, exactly. There's it's something what are like, crops? there are 7,000 edible crops in the world, give or take, aren't there? And yet 95% of what we eat comes from 30 of them. Yeah, and, if you, and if you look at the world's calories, around half of the world's calories are made up of just 
um, rice, wheat, maize, sugar, soybeans, and then, I mean, the sixth one... Bit of meat. Bit of meat, well, animal, animal products, stuff. Yeah, yeah, which is probably mostly processed yeah. meat. And, so, and, uh, and some, of those, some of those are sugar. I mean, sugar comes in twice over because, of course, the main use of maize now is high fructose mm. corn, corn syrup, syrup, which people mm. think they might be drinking sugar in their Coca-Cola. Mm. And in some countries they might, but mostly they're drinking corn, mm. uh, which is an extraordinary thought. Um, but, B, you've written brilliantly about uh, some amazing stories in other parts of the world that we could learn some great lessons from. Well, that was, I was just going to say, looking around here, and you were saying, why can't we market wonderful vegetables. Well, South Korea, so sometimes we can get so pessimistic in this conversation as well. And when I was researching my book, I kept thinking there has to be some country that somehow, I mean, it's what these countries have in common, pretty much every country in the world, that we've, we've passed through something called the nutrition transition, which was named by a man called Barry Popkin, who's professor of nutrition in the States. And in some ways, the nutrition transition is great because it what is what happens as countries have economic development. But the downside is you get this rise of diet related ill health and you get the unfettered power of the ultra processed food industry. And I asked Barry Popkin, is there anywhere in the world that somehow passed through this transition without that? And the answer that everyone seems to come up with is South Korea. And there's a whole host of reasons why, one of which is kimchi, which is that um, fermented cabbage, garlic and Chili. Quite, quite a whack of chili. Quite, yeah, yeah quite a whack of yeah. It's addictive. I mean, yeah. like, it is addictive, isn't it? If you can I mean, it's very cheering that that's a solution. Mm. Yeah, so we, that's we, have we have ketchup. We have ketchup. They have fermented addictive. cabbage, and fermented yeah. cabbage does it. So that's, that's, but we're getting a taste for it. We're we are on the we way. Are. I, I find now, if I give talks and ask people, I don't give talks anymore because that's changed. But if I asked people in the audience how many people have had kimchi, hands were shooting yeah. up, and quite old people were saying, "I oh, yes, I had my first kimchi yeah. last." So that's changing. But particularly in the kind of places where you and I give talks, give book uh, talks, probably. which is which is also yes. <laughs> you know we are sometimes preaching to the converted, yeah. which but is the hardest thing. But there's this cultural reasons in Korea, which is yeah, you're right. They love kimchi the way that we love ketchup, and they, eat, I mean, something close to. Is it something like 200 grams of kimchi per person per day? Something like that. <laughs> something insane like Something that. insane. But the government also saw, as Hugh has said, that it had a responsibility to protect its, the health of its citizens through food and to protect agriculture at the same time. So it's kind of win-win. It's, it's exactly this story that we're meant to be talking about tonight. You and the planet and sustainability. So they invested in cooking workshops right. so that... South Koreans would not forget how to make the delicious traditional dishes of their grandmothers, but they also put adverts on TV so that when children switched on TV, instead of seeing some extremely clever advert to make them want to drink chocolate milkshake and buy tortilla chips, they saw adverts telling them how great local organic farming was. And yeah. the other thing I imagine, I mean, they, they didn't do this while banning imports of uh, fizzy drinks and, 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 and junk food. They, they did it as a countermeasure. They did it as a counter and they And they did it as, out of a sense of responsibility for the, for the health of, of, the, of the country and, and it's kind of for, for national mm. pride. And, and you know, this is the kind of intervention that must, I think, be on the cards now. It's been shown to work, mm. um, but as have some more, more heavy-handed heavy interventions, more, more, even more, I mean, we've had our sugar tax. It is being shown to have some effect. Uh, but other countries like Chile has had an even more, uh, well, a much bigger number, I think 15% uh, tax on, on a certain threshold. Uh, and, and Chile's addressed food labour. But it's not like this country doesn't have a history of intervention which was very successful, i.e. I, rationing. You know, it's yes. a radical kind of solution to a big food problem yeah. where the government stepped into the kitchen. But and also telling, people, us, to get, telling yeah. us to eat more of what at the time was, was available. meant to be the good stuff, like milk. There was a whole yeah. milk potatoes. marketing board. Potatoes. You know, yeah. eat more potatoes, eat more vegetables. But it was so nice you know. because it was positive. I often go back to yeah. that Ministry of War food propaganda. And even though you know, we'd have different categories now, they were sort of the bodybuilding food, the protective foods. And what was so nice <laughs> is that butter seemed to fit into every category. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yes, please. And signing but obviously, up. there wasn't much of that to go around. But still, the idea that butter was just seen as this golden pat of goodness. Um, but it was exactly saying to people, this is good. Whereas now I feel so much government dietary advice in the UK is just negative. It's just pick low fat cheese instead of real delicious cheese. And well, it's also actually... inviting people to, to try and solve their problem primarily by, by picking alternative mm. processed foods mm. like 
you know, if, if you're worried about this, try mm. the low fat version mm. or the or the zero <laughs> sugar version of this same mm. thing, which already exists in a brand that you that you know and are perhaps fixated on. Uh, rather than getting back to the basics and boosting our, our agriculture by talking about real food, whole ingredients. I mean, the, the wholeness in food to me is, 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 it's, is, is the quality that we should be really shouting about. What do you mean by wholeness? Well, it's a, it's a good question because I realise as soon as I, you say the word whole foods, becomes... you've, got to be, you've got to pull the two words apart and make them into separate words because if you put them together, people are immediately thinking of brown rice and mm. lentils and beans. But everything growing in this garden is a whole food. Mm. A steak is a piece of a whole food. Mm. Milk, it, it's straight from the cow or, or even pasteurised. Is, and, and, and of course, there's a sliding scale. Some f foods are wholer than others and some are very very interfered with but once you once you start stripping bits out of the food and it's always the good bits you know you want to take the brown out of wheat mm -hmm. to make w white wheat flour a more malleable plastic mm -hmm. which is another bugbear in my mind it's essentially to make it a plastic ingredient that can be molded into many many different shapes and textures you you take out the goodness um so we and there's not and there's so many ways of making food delicious where you where you don't need to do any of that well, speaking of deliciousness, I will be really interested to hear from both of you about the two sort of campaigns, charities that you're involved in, Taste Ed and Veg Power, Veg Power, Power. which is about connecting children to the pleasure of food, the joy of food, because I think we do get fixated on, you know, being critical and, and doom laden and what's bad. And these are, this is a very opposite approach, isn't it? Could, could you perhaps talk about, because I think they have some genesis together, oh, they don't do. they? And we've, totally we've done, a, I've done events together with Veg Power in school. Veg Power is great too. Talk, can you talk about Taste Ed? Then? So Taste Ed, Ed which is short for Taste Education, we were inspired by a system of education they have in Finland and other Nordic countries called Sapara. And the whole idea is pleasure. I mean, I think we get into terrible trouble whatever age we are when we put pleasure in one box and health in another. Mm -hmm. um, because really, you lead somebody to healthy food through joy. I mean, uh, which also is saying you lead them there through their own senses. So the basic idea of Taste Ed is that you use, you encourage a child to use all of their five senses to interact with food in a really non-judgmental way. So we start every lesson by saying, no one has to like, no one has to try, which may be very different from how parents, including myself, <laughs> have spoken to their children <laughs> yeah. at the dinner table, where there's a kind mm, of sense yeah. of, I really want you Eat to that, try this. Or you get no pudding. But within yeah. that safe space, saying no one has to try, no one has to like, they feel the judgment is taken off their shoulders and then they can get stuck in mm and they touch things, they smell things, they listen to food. Like we never even talk about the sound that food makes. And it's a profound thing where sometimes a child doesn't want to eat something because it's too crunchy and too loud. I mean, yeah. you have children on the autistic scale who are quite terrified of certain sounds, squelchiness, um, different textures. And what we have found, and there's evidence to back it up, actually from Korea again, but also from Finland and France, is that this method is far, far more effective as a form of food education than the traditional teach them about five a day and then go away and hope that they'll use this very abstract knowledge to change their own behaviour. I mean, it's not the whole part of the jigsaw by itself because you could give a child a full course of taste ed, awaken a desire in them for delicious green vegetables. We've then got to make those vegetables available, affordable in the school and Ideally, we've got to give their parents the wherewithal to cook them and enough money to be able to buy them. Mm -hmm. But it is a crucial part of the picture. I mean, that, that physicality is key, and it, go, it goes back to it's re, it's re investing in a very natural instinct of young children, which is to pick stuff up, shove it up mm. their nose, break it mm. in half, see if they can make it into something yes. sticky, and all those things. And mm. a lot of that's been taken away from us. And, 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 and not only do children not get to do that, they barely get to witness it happening mm. in a domestic mm. kitchen. Many children's first experience of solid food or nearly solid food is to see a jar being unscrewed. Or they, they don't know what food is at physically. a really basic yeah. level. It's not People sometimes say, well, in order to eat better, you should study the label to see what's in something, or you should find out where something comes from. They That's don't quite know, far down the they're, line. They're not even there. They've never, they'll make these kind of heartbreaking comments like, I don't know, we're going to have to adapt it for a time of COVID because obviously passing around jars of things and smelling them and everyone shoving their nose. But you can do it, you can do it at home with your own kids. You can do it you? at home with your own kids. And also all you need to do is just place the things on separate little plates and it still works beautifully. 
but um, we've, we do these ones where you, again, it may change, but it will come back, where we were plunging our hands into socks and you have different things buried in the sock and it might be an onion and it might be a pomegranate and it might be <laughs> an apple. Kind of playing with the Christmas <laughs> yes. stocking thing. And, there, then and then just thinking, it's actually, I have learned from it, like how different a papery onion feels compared mm. to the kind of roughness mm. of a pomegranate. And you get them to describe it. You get them to describe it and then the language they come up with is extraordinary. So somebody said the pomegranate is rough like the playground. And you feel it is, like, mm. I suddenly had this, visceral childhood memory of sort of falling down in the playground and that feeling under your knees and pomegranate is like that. Asphalt pomegranate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll say, that, I mean pomegranate, maybe you're not surprised they haven't tried that or felt it, but they'll say, I've never felt an onion. Mm. You think, mm. how has somebody mm. reached the age of eight and they've never felt an onion? Mm. Because their parents, as you say, maybe have never had yeah. the time. It's, it, you see children making these comments at all ends of the social economic scale as well, which I find interesting. There's the parents who are super, super busy and are putting the children in breakfast club and after school club, no time to sit down and eat. Again, the pandemic changed that maybe for those families. Mm. And then there are the kids where vegetables are expensive and daunting. And if the parents didn't grow up eating them themselves, it maybe seems new and weird. But I mean, none of these things are, are hard to do in a, in a classroom. You know, b b classrooms have lots of really expensive kits mm. in them. I this mean, is cheap. It's they accessible. don't all have what they want, obviously. It's but, easy. But, you know, to get a beetroot and an onion and a carrot and a, and it's a, a lettuce cheap. It, it's, is not it's a cheap. difficult... Yeah. And, it's, and it boosts their literacy because what you find is that the children who feel they lack confidence in writing and speaking will come up with these extraordinary metaphors mm. like the pomegranate playground without even noticing that's what they're doing. They'll say these things like, the pepper looks like a wax lantern, or, I mean, the, the number of yeah. strawberry ones. I mean, we, ones, we've got yeah. to get to a point where these sort of activities in schools are not fringe experimental projects no. that have just should be been, a basic entitlement. It, it's a I, basic, I, I, basic right for children to be able to interact with food and understand what good food is and be encouraged to see it in a really positive way from the moment they go to school. And yeah. in Finland, I, they have it. it. Every child in Finland gets it. Amazing. Well, I think we could go further. I think you could say you can teach the whole curriculum through food. Mm. You can do you, history, yeah. geography. I mean, you know, there's almost mm. nothing you can't teach through mm. food using it as a lens to think about the world that we there is an amazing school in London with. Charlton Manor where they have developed an entire curriculum around history geography and also another school in Lincolnshire with the head teacher I work with Jason O'Rourke where every opportunity to get food in they do yeah so taste ed should be the start you know, make sure you actually know your fruits and vegetables and you you feel comfortable with them then cooking growing, gardening i mean growing, growing. Well, yeah. history geography yeah. Yeah. you know it's yeah. all in food isn't it but so, this sort of brings me on this sort of relates to the other question i wanted to ask you you know you've written that amazing book first bite which is about how we learn to eat and then um, the way we eat sort of strategies for how to eat better your forthcoming book, Eat Better Forever, coming out in uh, December yeah. 2020, both, again, looking at strategies for eating better. But I wanted to ask you, first of all, I've got a few questions, but first is, why is it so difficult to know what to eat? It's so basic, mm. isn't it? Why is it so hard? Why do we need these books? Well, I think uh, one of the reasons is the extraordinary profusion of, of choice, the, the, mm. the, the, the way in which food has exploded and as B writes very eloquently in her book I mean that was that was about solving a very urgent problem of malnutrition globally and and uh, diseases that were the result of people getting not either not enough food or not enough the right kinds of food and it, it's been an extraordinary successful project it's been globally I mean of course there are mm -hmm. still corners of the world where people are desperately undernourished and, and, and life is very, very mm. hard. But if you actually look at the statistics, mm. the standard of, of living the, and the food availability, it's gone. Um, but the side effect of that is this extraordinary industry that learnt to do volume mm. and has now become extremely skilled at, at taking those, I mean, the vast majority of that wheat Maize, it's sugar. An it doesn't, it doesn't mean, go it to choice, stop people. It's, it's a it funny doesn't kind go of to choice, stop people it? going hungry anymore. It gets mm. spun and extruded into all sorts mm. of different products that are put back to us with very uh, catchy ideas and campaigns and, and sold back to us as junk. And what do you mean by that there's not really choice or it's not? It's a strange sort of choice. I mean, so to give you an example, I mean, th this was one that really stuck with me. I mean, I look at products. I mean, I, th I hope that this product has sold um, less 
during the pandemic. I kind of assume it must have done because of changing patterns of our lives. But the snack bar, aka the protein bar, I mean, to me, this is a product, it's, it's a kind of nonsense. It's well, masquerading. It's nuts, is as, what it is. It is nuts. <laughs> I mean, it's, not, it's, it's maybe nuts yes. and raisins and maybe some little bits yes, of Yes, and it costs more than a pound each if you buy it at a yeah. gym. And why it's, does it have to be glued together? Why it's does it have sticky? to be glued together? It's a piece of engineering. It's been sold to us as the epitome of healthy eating. Mm. And actually, it's really not much different from a candy bar. And in the States, at the time that I was writing the book, according to an industry insider, there were 4,000 different iterations of snack bar on the market. Who needs that? And who can even begin to compute? There what, what's wrong with a, a, a little snack pack with some actual nuts, actual raisins, yes. and actual little that's, bits of chocolate? That's so radical. And then, <laughs> that's a crazy idea. But nobody makes money the from that. The recipe's in my new book. <laughs> oh my God. Must it's not rocket it. science, but it is one of the things mm. you'll get, is a recipe for mm. the loose version mm. of a classic uh, squished grain But that's, that's what I mean by bar. fake choice. I mean, it, that's an insane level of choice. It's a cognitive burden to go into a modern supermarket where... There are 40 to 50,000 separate stock keeping items. And to choose between all of those, um, we need simpler choices, but we also need more meaningful choices. What do you think is the sort of relationship between our love affair with convenience and the problem of food? Because really that kind of squashed bar mm. is, it, it's kind of sold as convenience in a pack, isn't it? It's quick, it's efficient, it's healthy. You know, it's all there. You don't have to do anything like take nuts out of a packet you know or anything like that but uh, you know we're kind of wedded to convenience mm. is that part of the problem as well sort of tearing ourselves away from that as a kind of narrative that's supposed to be so seductive it, it is really challenging that because we are we are absolutely addicted to convenience and we're going to have to do a little bit of reinventing that and a lot of people are very busy ha wha have very little but it's you know, about, resource it's partly about you know, working it, patterns i mean right so often I think with this we'll say something like we're addicted to convenience or it's, it's almost moralising on ourselves saying oh, there's some problem with us and we don't see again. I mean, during the pandemic, when suddenly you're stuck at home, the desire for the protein bar, I imagine, I mean, I don't have much desire, for them, but I imagine it kind of evaporates. It's the desire for the protein bar comes around because so many people in Britain are forced to work insane long hours and made to feel bad if they take a lunch break and made to feel bad if they take a lunch break whereas uh, I interviewed this nurse who'd been a nurse in the 1970s who said it was obligatory everyone whether you're a nurse whether you're a doctor you had to sit down and have a hearty two-course meal with lashings of gravy followed by lashings of custard and then everyone had a cigarette <laughs> and then they went back on the wards <laughs> those were the days and it was now in a workplace unless you work for Google or something the employer has no sense of obligation towards the people they're employing to feed them. Yeah. And I interviewed a food writer from Denmark who said, you know, the, there's a common sense that work stops, I think she said maybe at five o'clock. So then that's cooking time. Five to seven mm. is family and cooking time. Do that's a very good thing to, to try and get to click back into the culture because the, the yes, people want convenience, but you, you've got a choice. I mean, the moment you need that convenience, maybe if it stays like this in the work culture is because you've only got a few minutes for lunch but if you've taken a moment where you'd had a little bit more time in your mm -hmm. kitchen the evening before you can make a wonderful lunch box or even mm -hmm. if you get up five minutes earlier you can put together some really nice things it can be super convenient mm -hmm. you're in control you make the choices you'd put in the healthy foods that you know you like eating you can experiment and change things around i i think the portable healthy lunch box uh, made with you know, mm. ingredients that you gather from the supermarket. Uh, a, a sturdy box grater mm. is a very, very handy tool. I love tool. the box grater. It's yeah. a great undervalued the, uh, utensil. 97% yes. of the time using the coarse side well, of it. Yes, just, absolutely. Uh, I think, explain why to those of us who haven't been converted. Because, you, because, in, because in five seconds you can take a carrot into a grated carrot. You can make an amazing carrot. root vegetable salad that you tastes great like luxury. luxury. You can put a grated you can a carrot, a grated okay. apple, I, saw, I nuts, thought that you were taking the box grater in your packed lunch. You're no, 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 you're getting busy. I was thinking this is radical i mean uh people give me funny looks at work um but you you, you you're giving five Fine. or ten minutes with the box grater in the morning putting the, the some point lovely is it's not together. even really cooking it's assembling but you feel uh, in and there's nothing wrong with that i mean I, I, do you know great. what i honestly think assembling is exactly what we need to become adept mm. at 
good healthy things that go together well and when you put them together become a little bit more than the sum of their parts. They speak to each other, they mingle, they exchange mm -hmm. their juices, you introduce a dressing, you've got texture from nuts, sweetness from, and you're from not a little wasting pop of fruit. The old vegetables in the bottom of the salad compartment, you can use up anything in those kind of boxes. You certainly you? can in a soup. Mm. I'm not sure I'd want the really tired lettuce to get in there with my <laughs> freshly grated carrot. Mm. But yeah. You could shred it very finely and it might be all right. It might be all right. It would become, you could call it seaweed mm. at that point. Mm. So, so both your books, which are looking at kind of strategies for diet, you said assembling, having lunch boxes that are ready. What, what other strategies do you, do you think are absolutely essential or, or would you sort of, you know, gift to people if they wanted to change their diet or, or, or just eat more? healthily, more easily, with more pleasure? Well, I think next after wholeness or alongside wholeness, variety. I mean, variety is a really interesting thing because variety can be dazzling and, the, and, the, and the, the extraordinary amount of choice that we have at any one time of foods that are not seasonal but flown from all, all over the world. But when it comes to fruit and veg, just making sure not to forget that there are some really lovely things that you like that you might not have had for a while and just picking them up. So one of the things I encourage people to do is to do a fruit and veg audit. Just write down all the veg that they like and then use the, a, a book with, with an index in it mm. to find some more. Talk to the rest of the family and very soon you've got a shopping list of things that, oh yeah, God, you know what? We haven't eaten green beans for two weeks and we all like them. Let's go and get but some. Also, if, you're, if you do that audit and you find, like, I mean, this is a huge hidden problem, which I wrote about in First Bite, that actually you are somebody with really selective tastes, even as an adult. I mean, that's, this is a huge hidden part of the story that we just don't talk about. Because in all of this government advice, people are told, eat this, eat this, come on, don't eat that. Nobody stops and asks, as with the children in Taster, do you like this? Do you, what do you like? You're and, asked and a question, what do you like? And what you need to know is you can change your own appetites mm -hmm. at any age. I mean, yeah. I think that's a crucial message. Not all of them. You know, you may have no-go areas. You may have tried beetroot for those 13 times and the chemical geosmin earthy taste in it just doesn't mm -hmm. agree with you're you. So, you're Fine. so right. Change it, learning, making learning it you've being open-minded and knowing you can it, change yeah. and knowing you can take something that you love and pair it with something you are uncertain of and that suddenly something clicks and you love the other thing too. Uh, this is a question we could, everyone could ask themselves and I, I'm going to ask you, what, what's, the, what's a, a, something, a, a fruit or vegetable that you used to hate and now you love? I mean, I, to, kohlrabi. kohlrabi. I still don't love it, but I used to find it really, really boring and now I can see that texturally it's very exciting. <laughs> but I've got some basic, I used to hate tomatoes and now mm, I love really? them. I couldn't eat a mushroom and now, and now I think they're one of my favourite things. And you can decide to mm. have, you know, most people don't like beer the first time they drink it, but they no, come yeah. round to it fairly rapidly. Coffee rapid. and Once coffee, the, same, yeah. And Blue you can cheese, also, the yeah. other thing you can do that I think is incredibly useful is wean yourself off a sweet tooth. Mm -hmm. And I know this because I have a really sweet tooth. I, I mean, the cooking I learnt was to, to cook cakes and biscuits and sweets and make the puddings mm. for my mum's 70s dinner parties. <laughs> I was obsessed with sweet cooking. And I used to have a lot of tea in my sugar. Sugar in my tea. <laughs> sugar in, well, so that kind of says it all, doesn't it? Um, and so the I, spoon was standing upright. But I made yeah. several attempts mm. to, to, to give up sugar in my mm. tea. And, and uh, they found it, and because I'd usually give up after a week. And then somebody mm. just said to me, it takes two weeks. Mm. And actually, after okay. two weeks... But also, I think it's what you're setting out to do. I like that phrase you use, unsweeten your palate, which is the same one I use. This is why I think the sugar tax has been problematic although I think it's a very hopeful gesture because it shows that industry will adapt when it's forced to adapt and when government takes intervention seriously but what you get with the sugar tax is a whole load of artificially sweetened drinks flooding into the food supply. Which have their own set of problems. Which have their yeah. own set of problems. Um, there's a lot of emerging research suggesting that actually they're just as much implicated in type 2 diabetes as sugary drinks for reasons we mm. don't fully know. There may be some way in which they're fooling the gut into thinking that you're consuming sugar. But the bigger one to me is that for as long as, um, like when I was a teenager, I was addicted to Diet Coke and I also had a very unhealthy diet. And then I just slowly stopped drinking it. And now I, it doesn't appeal at all. But I'm really, I feel lucky that it doesn't appeal. Yeah. It doesn't make me morally superior in any way. No. It's just easy to avoid it. And if I but pick I've, up a cup of tea that's got a spoonful of sugar in, I might spit it out. Whereas, mm. uh, But I feel that for as long as you're coating your mouth with sweetness every time you drink something, even if it's a diet soda, it's then quite hard to mm. actually kick that 
sugar habit. I'm not saying people, I still love cake. I'm not saying people should wholly well, cook I, the, kick I, the sugar habit. I think what's so interesting, like we're talking at a kind of individual level, but because our tastes can change, they can transform, it's actually incredibly positive. You know, we're very, you know, we feel very sort of anxious and concerned about the state of food, mm. but we know it can change. Can we change. know that tastes can change. We are where we are, but it, we it don't can, stop here. It, mm. And it has never been stuck in one place. You know, traditions evolve and, and tastes change in a way that is could be very exciting and positive. Having said that, I was going to ask, I wanted to ask, I don't know if you saw last night uh, the Attenborough programme, Extinction. We know that... Uh, you know, California is burning. I think a recent report has just come out saying that Britain has missed 17 of its 21 yeah. targets for biodiversity. Pretty grim news in terms of the environment. Do you think we are finally at a turning point where the, the people that need to have to take this seriously and and have it, that's the kind of macro and then at a kind of small level, what, what can we all do? What are the single things that you think we should be doing as individuals in relation to food and the environment? Well, one of the things that's been interesting uh, uh, during this strange time is our habits around food. Of uh, you know, m maybe more of us have got around the table, and that's been good. I think a lot more people have connected with nature in whatever way they could. If it was in, even if it was in their back garden or managing just because it was the only little, thing they could do. Yes, even if it's just yeah. going for a little walk. And yeah. I, actually, one of the things I think the government got wrong was not encouraging us to go out into open spaces, mm -hmm. making it absolutely clear how to behave safely in open spaces, and then saying go and find some open space because mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would have been much better for all of us and those of us who are lucky enough to have it on our doorsteps benefited yeah, yeah, yeah. hugely so let's get that right if there's a next time round but i think that i think that it it's be, it is becoming i mean the, I mean, one thing that's ex interesting and exciting is that s the solutions that are right for our health are generally the solutions that are right for the for the planet um, eating less meat, uh, switching to not necessarily going completely vegan, but to a plant-led diet uh, definitely leads the way in terms of reducing our carbon footprint around food. I mean, I, yeah, I just think we need to hugely reform agriculture in Britain and beyond to think what are the things that we could be growing more of here? I mean, Tim Lang is very eloquent on the subject. You know, we could be growing amazing nuts in the UK. We know that the almonds that so many of us love, when they come from California, they're implicated in drought. But what if we were growing more delicious, varied nuts in the yeah. UK? I would be absolutely up for buying that. And I think there's some sweet spot at which, as Hugh says, health and sustainability and consumer choice all should coalesce. I mean, it, there are so many varieties of fruit that we should have more of. I mean, it's kind of, there is something so weird, which people like Hugh have been pointing out for years, that given we're an incredible apple growing nation you go into the supermarket and you're just confronted by imported pink lady apples and air freighted golden delicious and not the just full array of wonderful juicy hard crunchy apples that from the uk and you write about this so beautifully in in your book about how that then the pink lady or the kind of supermarket grape becomes the defining grape it becomes the defining the apple the, the banana, banana. So which cavendish. i buy a lot of for my children because there is no other thing other than the cavendish banana but there's something people that know about bananas say it's not even a tasty banana i used to go to school with this a friend of mine from nigeria and she used to bring back from lagos these small bananas oh. and they were a different they weren't a banana yes. in in my world they, they, lemony, were, don't they? they were extraordinary yeah. and, and i can always remember the bananas i eat are not those bananas and where can i find those bananas I can only get one type but that's of banana. a brilliant example of kind of taste and the needs of the planet and climate absolutely go together because it's not sustainable it's a monoculture of monocultures the previous banana that we had the gros michel was wiped out by panama disease this one is on the brink of potentially um falling prey to similar disease and and the way to avoid that happening is to have a diversity of, of crops mm. of the same the and it's the same with things same. like wheat i mean we're looking at wheat crops were not great for this year that's another sort of feeling of food security on the precipice and I those old land race yeah. varieties are, are yeah. much more resilient. I was very excited by something you wrote in, in, in your book about, uh, I think it was Dan Barber, who's a mm. well-known American chef who takes, likes taking all these problems on and finding solutions. And he challenged, he, he had a, a vegetable grower in his mm. restaurant and he said, guys, why, 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 do butternut, why are butternut squash so boring? Can't you make a better one? And this guy mm. took it to heart. 
and and they've actually launched a really successful, much tastier, mm, the honey uh, nut, miniaturized yeah. version of a butternut yeah. squash. Yeah, and which it's I amazing. Which I think is also good, and, and the skin's more palatable and it, nutritionally it's, it's got denser, a better profile. It's denser, it's smaller, it's... It's got more nutrition, it's got more flavour, it's win, win, win. And I just think Dan Barber is amazing because he's asking all these questions and saying, well, actually, a recipe starts with a seed. Let's go all the way back to the seed and think, can we find crops that are going to tick all of these boxes? I mean, he also did this thing, which I think is so clever, which is one of the reasons, I've already mentioned this, but one of the reasons some children don't like beetroot is because of that earthy taste. I love the earthy taste, by the way, but some Help don't. yourself. Yeah, I'm just staring at the <laughs> A lot of different varieties here, actually, about five. But for people who don't, he worked with plant breeders to say, can we have the sweetness of beetroot without the earthiness? And it turns out you can. It's just that in his conversations with plant breeders, most people never even ask these questions because the seed industry has but not it, been but interested. But isn't it extraordinary when you, when you go and look at the range of tortilla chips or crisps, you've got mm. a squillion different flavours mm. now. And actually, it's very possible to have you know, many, many different flavours. You can have a grape that tastes like a strawberry. You mm. can have a, a tart one, a sweet one, mm. uh, beetroots that taste sweeter and less. The, the possibilities are endless. Mm. And we absolutely know how to do that. And you don't need to modify these things genetically either to, to achieve those ends. Mm. So, so that's something to be excited about, the idea that we might seduce people into eating more healthy food by starting to make it, systematically grow it to be more delicious. Mm. We have got a lot of questions it's coming in, me. which is wonderful. But I wanted to ask one more final question, which is that if I gave you the, the power to be all powerful and you can change one thing about the food system. Oh, you gave us what three. Is, on, did no, I give you, I told you three, but no, no, there's one, too many one questions. Is, one is you can fine. have one. You can, you go first. <laughs> Gosh. Goodness. I mean, you've got two together, so don't choose the same one. Well, I was, can I say education, yeah. but were you going to, I mean, I would say education, but education is in its most holistic sense. And if you actually, I mean, I want taste ed as a universal entitlement for children in school, but I can see that's not the whole solution. If you really think about how we learn to eat, most of the messages we're given about food from childhood onwards are given us by the environment in which we learn to eat. And therefore, the chief educator of a child's palate is the ultra-processed food industry. If there could be a government that really, really took seriously, how would we engineer a food environment in which it would be easy for the healthy choice to be the kind of cheap, automatic choice, the healthy, sustainable, mm. vegetable-centred choice? That's a very long answer. I don't know. That's very wordy. Well, it's no, quite I, a short but answer, it, which, I, would, which, well, I, could, which I couldn't agree with more, more, more strongly. It, edu that you can't... Top education is top of the list. Okay, it, so that's number one. It takes many, many forms, mm. and and you know what, you know, advertising is a form of education. Mm. It's not a great. I mean, so it's 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 not a, and it's an incredibly powerful. For I mean, it, it, it's influence. That, I mean, you mm. can describe education in in, in many many in different broad ways. Sense, but yeah. I mean, we talked uh, earlier on about uh, intervention uh, from government, and I would like to see. The, the government put uh, the, put the, the obesity crisis at the absolute top mm. of its list of, of priorities. It, it's causing devastation in this mm. country. It's causing so much sickness and unhappiness. And you know, one of the things that one of the areas of education is, you know, doctors are not very well trained mm. in how to advise or help people mm. with dietary problems. There's a taboo in talking about diet when you go and see your G GP. Mm. We have to all be educated to understand that, that the food we eat is our primary source of health and well-being. So that, that's what needs to be top of the agenda. Food makes all the difference. Everything else comes after. I think, and I think both of your books and all your writing and your work are testament to the fact that, you know, all these things you're saying about that actually, you know, doctors need to help people learn how to eat. They, we all need to learn how to eat. And it's a, it's a sort of lifelong journey, isn't it, to learn what to you know what our diets should look like that it isn't just natural and straightforward and i think there are many possibilities mm. uh, and reasons to glimmers of hope mm. that that be mm. identified and i, and I also think right. sorry there's one more thing but we hugh's point about wholeness the flip side of that is we should be much blunter and clearer and more urgent about where the problem lies which is with the ultra processed food industry in this country the phrase ultra processed isn't even on the agenda the food industry doesn't want it to be on the agenda because as soon as you identify that as the dividing line and the problem everything starts to look quite different 
especially at a point where in, in, in this country, as in others, we probably tipped 50% of all the calories that mm. we get in this country come from mm. ultra processed foods. Mm. Well, I could ask you a million more questions, but I've got a whole heap of questions on this Gosh, iPad okay. coming, coming <laughs> yeah. in live. It's very exciting. Uh, so I'm going to start reading some of them out. I've got one here from Jason Hines of uh, Neil's Yard Dairy, the artisan cheese farmhouse cheese um, uh, retailer, uh, Munger. Hello, Jason. Uh, and he says, um, Hugh talked about preaching to the converted. In my personal experience during lockdown, communicating farm cheese to a public that had never been exposed to it, the response of people eating great British cheese for the first time was amazingly positive. I realise that I have been guilty of preaching to the converted for 25 years and consequently not been reaching this incredibly receptive public. As communicators of great food, do be and Hugh think we should modify our approach, approach to make converts of the millions of people in the UK who have not had a fresh onion or an amazing piece of cheese but they would love it if they did yes <laughs> <laughs> so yes, changing communication changing how we well, communicate well, we, have to change, we, we have to change we have to change i mean it's, it's connected to the advertising thing and we have to change the way we communicate the story of food mm. and i mean one thing that that cheese has going for it and neil's yard dairy has in spades is it can spin some wonderful yarns. I mean, not that they're not true. Mm. I'm not saying they're making stuff up, but they've got some wonderful stories about cheese. And cheese is, you know, cheese, le it, it's an artisan product. And it's, also we talk it, about convenience. It's about the most convenient artisan product you could, because you just eat it. You don't, yes, I mean, you don't need anything else. <laughs> yeah. no, th no, that's right. But, but uh, telling good stories around good food mm. is an incredibly important thing. I mean, mm. one of the things that I think is, is, you know, one of the pleasures of going to a farmer's market is to meet the actual grower and, and talk to them about what they do. And they can tell you all sorts of stuff about what's in, in front of you that you, that you didn't know. And, and you, that's something you take home with you. And I would go as, so far as to say that changes the taste of that food. It certainly changes your emotional connection to it. And you know, taking away the anonymity of food and bringing back the story of how that food was produced also, if that, if that re-emerges as something that matters to all of us, it also puts the onus on producers to make sure their food does have a good story and isn't full of mm. things that you wouldn't want people to know about because you're expected to be open and honest. But it is difficult. It is, I mean, it was great that the pandemic did put the spotlight on things like British cheeses and suddenly opened up the market to people who maybe might have felt daunted before or thought that they weren't the right kind of person to be buying farmhouse cheeses. I do think it's hard that... The stranglehold of the supermarkets means that sometimes people just aren't aware that these things exist or they feel they're maybe too posh or they're for other people. Or but I, well, I think Jason's question is a sort of challenge to those of us that are already how can converted. He as a cheese it's about or him as a cheesemonger, but all of us in terms of how, I mean, you are amazing communicators. You, you make television programs that talk to everybody. It's, but it's how the, the message gets through, isn't it? But we shouldn't be too complacent about that because it is very hard. Mm. I, and I, I've long had a sense that you know, <laughs> loads of people there, out there who aren't the least bit interested in River Cottage and, and frankly, in this conversation. And, <laughs> and, and that's hard because I think it would be worth everybody's while to, to be interested, but if they're just not, then that is a hard yeah. barrier to reach across. I think more people are interested than ever before, but I think it's, I do still think these are these real structural problems that there are places in the country where somebody might have a desperate desire to buy some Neil's Yard cheese, but they just think, where would I go? Well, that's, that's not on offer to me. That's, but we also, we can't do it on our own. And mm. this is why we need education. This is why we need government. If kids were in school handling beetroot and carrots mm. from the age of two or three, there, a lot of yeah. them would be a lot would more interested and excited. Yes. The they will become very different yeah. consumers. So it's in all terms. part right. of the same thing. Mm. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Here is a question from mm. Ray Nightingale. I already buy organic meat and dairy products from farms near me in Kent and I grow my own veggies, but I feel that unless I go vegan, I'm not really doing the right thing by the environment. Do you think that converting to veganism is the best thing to do for the future of the planet? Oh, you've passed that ball here. <laughs> no, I'm, I'll do, I'm happy to have a crack no, at it. Go vegan. I would say, well, I think if anyone wants to go vegan for the, I mean, I think it's, it's not like everyone has to do the same thing. I do think it's really important to remember that being an omnivore doesn't mean that we all eat everything. It means that different people eat different things in different environments. Um, there's been an argument that's been made, sometimes I think spuriously by the meat industry in Britain, that 
not all meat is the same, but it is very much true that the kind of lamb produced by someone like James Rebanks, who tweets so well as Herdy Shepherd, is an utterly different product from something like a mass-produced battery chicken. I mean, I, there is meat and there's meat, there is vegetables and there are vegetables. Um, you could weigh up the carbon footprint of every single thing you ate, but you'd get exhausted doing it and you might lose some of the joy of food. Personally, I'm not vegan, but I am convinced by the reports of things like the Eat Lancet report that eating far, 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 far less meat than most people do is the way to go. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I mean, I, one thing I've got no time for is, is, is vegan bashing. Or, I mean, the, some of my fellow chefs down the years used to be rude about vegetarians says oh, I wouldn't serve one in my restaurant I mean that's an utter nonsense we all need to take uh, yes. a big slice of responsibility for improving the nation's diet and improving and 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 one of the as chefs one of the things we really need to do is make sure that the vegetables on our menus in restaurants are mm. varied uh, br you know uh, uh, delicious and there's always lots and lots of them and then they somehow front of people's attention there was a really interesting study that just came out from Cambridge University I don't know if you saw it where they just changed the um, architecture of a student canteen so that the vegetarian options came first and because most people are naturally lazy that was all it took to make but people choose amazing. Amazing. But it, the architecture is one thing and the terminology because you, mm. you just said quite reasonably the vegetarian options but you could just say the vegetables yes no and it wasn't sold as the vegetables option that's the other crucial thing the it food, was just the lunch yes. whatever it is the lunch but the main the vegetarian main courses there were more of them and they came first and then you had to walk over to a different table to collect and a of meat course, option. of course normally it's the other way around yes once you've filled up with meat and potatoes mm. and pasta and rice the <laughs> salad bars over there guys guess what there's no room left on my plate mm. i mean that, that i like in india they call it veg and non-veg yes and i really like that because that's again saying well veg is the thing that comes first but you might sometimes want a bit of non-veg as some delicious seasoning you know, I, I just think also when you said don't vegan bash let's just not bash each other about what we eat altogether yeah. let's be a lot more tolerant across yeah. the board and accept that humans have diverse tastes that's a Great answer, thank you. And thank you, Ray. Um, here is a question from Joanne O'Rourke. I don't understand how we are more now than ever aware of the problems with plastic and yet still manufacturers are using plastic in our food. I was shocked to find out about plastic in tea bags and they're non-recyclable. Why do supermarkets and advertising agencies still encourage us to buy these things? I.e. the new product of coffee bags which cannot be recycled. We just don't really need them. Apart from not buying them, what else can we do to encourage supermarkets? to stock items that are beneficial for the society, for society and the planet. It's definitely your... <laughs> well, I've been, I have been uh, banging the gong uh, with, with my brilliant co-presenter, Anita Rani, on, on this. And uh, yes, the supermarkets are where, as, as so often, the, the, the multi, multiple retailers are, are, are the ones who really could lead on this and could do so much more. And it's not just tea bags, it's sandwich wrappers and it's, it's, it's produce that doesn't need any sort of plastic wrapping around it. And at the moment, we, they, pe people are so incensed about plastic that the supermarkets know they've got to do something. But I'm still a bit worried that there's too much, uh, you know, just nibbling at the edges. And a lot of what's happening is it's kind of window dressing. It's not really addressing the problem and dealing with it. There have been some big gains. I mean, what, what you really need with things like this is, is one of the big supermarkets to come and do something radically different. Mm. Uh, Waitrose has opened a store or, or has dedicated a big part of their store uh, to refill shopping. You can take mm. in any containers and get not just dry goods but milk and, and uh, frozen uh, vegetables and fruits and all, all sorts of other things. Tesco have banned the plastic wrap around multi-packs. Now that was a, that's mm. a no-brainer. I mean the idea that in order mm. to get a discount on four tins of beans, which have got no plastic <laughs> on them. They've got a, they've, they're a tin with some paper labels. Mm. Why do you put a plastic, and it's the crinkly hard kind of plastic that mm. can't be recycled, just so you can take that to the till. Mm. Four tins of beans, the electronics can do the job, you get your discount. So there's various no-brainers that have to happen, but we have to change the whole culture around plastic and supermarkets need to lead the way. And I do think a lot, as in with all of this, it's changing what's normal, isn't it? Because if you get to the point as a consumer, as clear as Joanne has done, of thinking, this is madness. Why am I bringing home like a piece yeah. of ginger that's wrapped in plastic when I would buy it at the local 
Asian supermarket and you just buy ginger as ginger, it's fine, isn't it? You peel it when you get it home. But you need to kind of reach that moment of thinking, this is madness. You and do. if enough people collectively... And, 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 and there has been progress and the government has made commitments on totally useless bits of plastic like plastic straws and stirrers and cotton buds. We have unfortunately taken a bit of a step backwards because of the pandemic. It's understandable. People are looking for, you know, confidence and, and protection and all the big stories about PPE in the health system has made people feel that somehow having a plastic mm. barrier between them and their food makes them safer. And also the well, rise of Deliveroo has yeah. continued, hasn't it? I and mean, I do think people, you've written about this in the past as well, like how we can have very different values with meat, for example, when we're cooking it for ourselves in the home or getting an Indian takeaway mm. thinking, well, we're not going to ask where that chicken comes from because somehow it's different. I think it's the same thing with plastics. You might be a conscientious consumer of plastics when you're out doing your grocery shopping and then suddenly you think, I'm tired, I want Deliveroo, and huge amounts. Which aren't in your control. And I, I do just want to finish the point about the, the, the plastic on our food. It doesn't make it safer. You know, the, yeah. if people have handled the plastic, that's just mm. as likely, and not very likely, but just as likely to transmit uh, the, the virus. Uh, arguably more likely, they think the virus hangs around on plastic longer than it does on other surfaces. So it isn't going to help us to, to, to move backwards mm. on this vital issue. And food is not a vector of COVID, thank God. I mean, no, yes. absolutely right. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Jill Norman. Uh, she says, how, and it's sort of related, how do we encourage the government to take steps to reduce the advertising of fast food and to persuade supermarkets to reduce the amounts on their shelves? Well, the, the, the government has said it is going to uh, look at uh, curb the ad advertising of junk food to children, the watershed, um, uh, because there are still huge family shows that have a massive impact on children that families watch together that are absolutely loaded with junk food advertising. And the government's been rightly under pressure mm -hmm. to address this for a long time, and they've said they're going to. So that, that's good news, but let's actually see it happen. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, I'm looking forward to part two of the national food strategy from Henry Dimbleby, which I'm hoping will address some of these things. But our government really needs to be a lot more radical, like Chile, where they said you cannot have cartoon characters on boxes of sugary cereals aimed at children. That is an incitement to eat a breakfast that they shouldn't eat, which it is when you think about it. But we just accept those things as normal. Um, but in Chile, they've banned that. They've come up with much stricter food labelling. I the, the, yes, they've got an actual flash on the front of the pack uh, saying... Warning. Very, very high in sugar. Yes. Not, 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 a, not a just some traffic, traffic light, light thing where you've got to scan it and you've got to figure out what it really means. It's just like, no, stop. And you're still a free citizen. You can still buy it. You can still eat as much sugar as you like. It's not... You, sometimes people say that's nanny state. That's terrible. It's taking away someone's freedom. It's not. It's just actually just some kind of countermeasure to this vast flood of... Be because often that's what you need food. is a moment of reflection mm. before you put mm. something in your shopping trolley and you can say, actually, you're right, there's a lot of sugar in that and I don't need it mm. today. And it's really difficult because those children's cereals, they may be very high in sugar, but they will definitely say something like fortified with vitamins, good for bones, calcium. So how are you meant to know? No, as no. A I mean, you need a sort of PhD in cereals to buy mm. a cereal almost, don't you? You know, it is so diff you know it's just so complicated, but I think... I, I, do, I, think our, I do think our traffic light system is not entirely without merit. People are getting yeah. the hang of it and, and red should be a very serious cause for concern on, on fat and sugar. Yeah. What was very uh, inappropriate is that the two biggest manufacturers of cereals in this country, Nestle and Kellogg's, ducked the traffic light labels mm -hmm. for a long time. They have finally come round to it, yeah. which is something. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Ian Wilkinson. Could you talk a bit about the Grow Your Own project you mentioned? The grow your own project. Yes, I think he might mean the... Uh, oh, veg power. veg power. You never talked yeah. about veg power. Uh, veg power. Yeah, veg power. Okay, well, th th thank you very much. Yeah. Well, veg power is aimed at addressing precisely uh, the power of advertising, and it's trying to harness the power of advertising uh, to go the other way and to promote vegetables using the same kind of creativity and getting children excited. And this is something that some very brilliant people... Uh, mm including Anna Taylor uh, at um, the Food Foundation and, and Dan Parker uh, and John Hegarty, so John Hegarty's got involved with that, have said we need to harness our 
creativity. We need to, to recognize that advertising is very influential in getting people to change their eating habits. And we need to champion healthy eating, and especially for kids. And it was a huge campaign, wasn't it? I mean, it was prime Fantastic. time yeah, ITV. And, and, and ITV stepped up and, and, and gave us some free advertising uh, to make it happen. And the, 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 the creative piece at the center of it was a campaign called Eat Them to Defeat Them, an exciting story of, uh, we, the, and the idea was to do something that hadn't been tried before and not just tell children that vegetables were good for them. It had a kind of sci-fi quality. Yeah, it had a sci-fi that the, the vegetables were coming to get you and the only way to get away from the vegetables was to eat them. And did you have a sense of how effective it was? Was that, do you? Yeah, the do metrics. You... The metrics are pretty good, and Great. particularly where supermarkets were directly uh, sharing, the, you know, the, the various materials to do with the campaign. It was a very short window. It was, you know, we were given it, uh, you know, around the new year. I think we got some. Uh, we got some ads out on the on on Ant and Dex, uh, one of their New Year shows, uh, back in 2019. Um, this, we can't allow something like this to be a flash in the pan. Mm. You know, we need to, and, and, nor can we allow it to be a sort of little kind of, uh, yes, the ITV will do this once because mm. we, it shows willing. You know, this needs to be systematic. And uh, so a one-off isn't good enough. We need to keep investing. Okay. We need support from government. And we need to recognize that creativity and advertising can cut both ways and needn't always be the bringer of doom and gloom in our food. I'm really, I'm so glad that Ian asked that question and we had mm. that uh, description of amazing. Thank yes, you. thank you to Ian. Yeah. Uh, here's a really important you still, question. Sorry, you can still see the ad <laughs> on YouTube if you uh, Google or use any other search. Ecosia is a very good one, by the way. Uh, <laughs> eat them to defeat them. Here is a really important question. It's from Professor Harry West at Exeter University and he says, as the end of Brexit transition approaches, should our food economy look inward, outward or both? Definitely both. I think we've been far too inward as a food economy for too long. I think we need to see the ways in which Britain is interconnected with other countries. But I do think, I mean, again, I'm going to cite Tim Lang. Um, Britain hasn't ever been and never will be self-sufficient in food, but the direction has all been towards us importing more and more and more food, becoming ever more reliant on these chains that begin to look extremely fragile. I and mean, well, none of us really knows the way that the pandemic is going to take the world, but even as it was with phase one, there were lorries that were going to Spain to collect fruits and vegetables to come into the UK that were being stopped. With Brexit, it's a giant question mark, but it should be a moment for us to reflect and think, what are the things that we could be growing in Britain and doing better here? Mm -hmm. And how can we sort of reconstitute the whole food economy to make it more equitable for people in Britain and beyond? And I think it's, it's as you touched on earlier, it's got to be to do with um, resilience from diversity as, mm. as well as resilience from quantity, uh, because there are things we're incredibly good at growing here. Of course, there's a lot of anxiety uh, about the potential for trade deals to lower the standards of the food in this country. And, and um, I, you know, and I think if you had if you had a referendum on that, it would be absolutely whole. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, there is strong feeling, isn't there? incredibly yeah. strong feeling. People don't want you know, the chlorinated chicken gets bandied about a lot. But there are many, many aspects mm. of this that we, we should, we're right to be worried about. Mm. We're right to be worried about, but I also feel, again, we could harness that in a positive direction, that what emotion is underlying that? There's a sense of pride in British food, which sometimes has maybe been misplaced, but which could be gathered back again and turned in a positive direction, as with the Ministry of Food during the war. Well, can I bring in this question then from Susanna, which is sort of related? She says, um, what are your concerns around food distribution networks and Brexit? Could such a disruption actually, um, could, sorry, could such a disruption of trade networks work in favour of developing UK-based food production, which has a reduced carbon footprint? Well, I suppose it might. I mean, one wouldn't want uh, the enthusiasm and support for local food networks to come by default through the breakdown of, uh, uh, of the whole structure of, of how we distribute food. I think people should be very interested in, 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 in sourcing and finding food locally for all sorts of reasons, because that's often where the quality is if food doesn't have to travel far. And it's so, so often where the, the story is and that it gives you the, the narrative to relate to your own community providing you with food, which 
which is something we could all do with. I do think as well, I don't know, I find it heartbreaking if we think of the number of EU nationals that we are all indebted to who have been our chefs, our waiters, our factory workers, our fruit pickers, um, the people who are growing and producing our fruit in other nearby countries such as Spain and France and Italy. And I sometimes feel there's just this basic kind of relationship which plays out with food, whether it's just a couple of friends sitting at a table or whether it's countries interacting with each other or and that there's this kind of profound ingratitude that we're somehow not recognising this huge debt that we have to Europeans. I'm not trying to make some party political Brexit point here, but I do just feel we have to recognise how important those people are. Massive and have contribution been. to... Huge mm. contribution. They fed us, which is the most and, wonderful and, and, thing. And they fed us good and food. They, and, they, and, they, and they also <laughs> give us our local food because they're often the people who are picking it and packing it and you know, getting it to us. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. This is a really important question from and a sort of comment from Naomi uh, Duguid. And she says... Surely the most important thing to fix if you have ultimate power is to ensure that everyone can afford good food. Food made by farmers and workers who are paid a living wage. So a guaranteed minimum wage must come first, surely, to build a strong base for the food system. What's your response? Well, I absolutely agree with, 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 with the first part of that, uh, that, that um, healthy food for all um, should be the primary objective. And if you can absolutely wave a magic wand, then that would be the thing to, to go for. Um, but I, I think when we were asked earlier about what would, what would be the policy change, I think it's not, it's not entirely straightforward to know what, it's more than one policy change that you would need to, to deliver that. But you'd first need a government that was determined to make it happen. But I like the way that Naomi has said, it's a right to good food, mm. it's a right to nutritious food, not just a right to food. And I think coming back to this post-war story that we keep alluding to, which is that governments after the Second World War piled investment into producing as many calories as possible, which probably at the time was a legitimate focus because there had been such terrible hunger during the Second World War. But now we need to think about, is food actually food? Is it our people earning enough to be able to buy the food that their bodies need. And that's a basic thing and it should be happening at both levels. It should be happening at a supply level of, is our food supply giving us what our bodies need? But it, Naomi's absolutely right that it's also a question of economics. I, I think um, one thing underlying that question that, that's really interesting, absolutely fair, fair pay for the hard work of everybody in the food mm. sector. But one thing that we, do have a problem with in, in, in this country and other countries have it too, is that we've come to believe that somehow food might be a really good area to save a bunch of money. That it's, mm -hmm. that, 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 that if, if well, we've we had this thought for a long time. I, I recently researched an article for the TLS on the concept of cheap food in Victorian England. And it was all about the life of the costermonger who were these street sellers. And it was the same then because people were desperate to have a cheap, sort of bag of whelks or a cheap oyster or a cheap apple or a cheap apple pie or as the case might be but and the, these people what, were starving but because what has changed is that the amount of our income that we're prepared to spend on food the portion of it has steadily gone it's down gone it's down been, and down it's, and down it's been mm. eroded and so i mean it's a bit like uh, so, someone i remember in your book who, who was asked how do you find the time to cook and she was like how do you find the time to watch television as well <laughs> How do you find the money to buy food? Well, how do you find the money to buy a new car? I mean, we do have to question sometimes what, you know, what, what's going to be top of the list. But I think the question, I think Naomi's question is right, which is like, when we talk about cheap food, it makes people very angry at both ends of the divide because some people will say, how can you be talking about cheap food being a bad thing when there are food banks and people can't even feed themselves? The question is, what's affordable? I mean, food should never be so cheap that the people who produce it are themselves in a state of penury or misery. Um, but it's a kind of, it's a circular thing between the producer and the consumer. It should be affordable at both levels. And, and we do have an ironic situation where the foods that have had the most interference have somehow become the cheapest. Mm -hmm. Whereas the foods that are whole and uninterfered mm -hmm. with uh, are more expensive and in some cases more expensive than they need to be. You have given us so many things to think about this evening. So much kind of complicated, but also sort of solutions to 
thinking about these incredibly complex problems. And um, I think the questions reveal how engaged everybody has been and, and such kind of you know, challenging questions, interesting questions. I'm so sorry to everyone whose question we were not able to get to, but I'm being told that I need to, I need to bring things to a, a sad close. So it seems I'm to have very, got dark. very so <laughs> has got cold. dark. <laughs> it has. Chilly. But thank you, thank you so much for the most fascinating discussion. Can, can I just really say, sorry, yes, please, can please, I just please, say one please, thing? I would love we, you to. We have touched on some really demanding questions about food and we've done our best and, and often not probably not well enough but if you really want to understand where we're at how we got here and what some of the uh, ideas for the future are th this book by B is brilliant it, everything that we've talked about is, is it, addressed in brilliant writing and with a, a lot of exciting thank answers. You, thank you. Hugh's, book, Hugh's book which is out in December. Yeah, Hugh's book is out in December 2020 but that brilliant book of Bee's and other books of hers and Hugh's brilliant books are available uh, on the tab on your screen right now. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the team at River Cottage who've made this possible. Thank you again to KitchenAid for your generous sponsorship. If you have enjoyed this evening's first event of the 2020 food season, do come back and join us for other events. I'm going to just tell you about a few which if you have found this discussion interesting, you will find completely riveting. Tomorrow evening, for anyone who's interested in the future of restaurants, the future of eating out, we have a wonderful panel discussion with Tim Hayward, Tim, Sh Tim Hayward, Tim Anderson, Jimmy Farrower, the food critic, and the chef Asma Khan. Then a week today, we've got the historian Simon Sharma in conversation with Claudia Rodan talking about uh, the history and the culture of Jewish food, which I just cannot wait to hear. And then we have an amazing double bill on Saturday the 26th um, on an event called The Future of Food, which is Dee Woods and Tim Lang. And that is then followed by an event called Beyond the Banks, which looks at different organizations, um, charities, activists across the country who are doing the most amazing work to connect communities to food in a positive way. We would love to see you there. And then there are many more events coming up through the rest of September and uh, October. If you would like to support the work of the BL, please do go to our visit, um, our donate screen uh, on, the, um, on your screens. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you, B and Hugh, for being as wonderful as you are in talking about and being an intervention in food and helping us to, to work out what we all need to do to make, to, to save the environment and to eat better. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.